Thank you. It's really fantastic to be here to speaking to such an illustrious audience. I know you handpicked each and every one of you. So I'd like to start out by sharing with you one of my favorite things. It's just a piece of paper, and it, I found it in my front garden when I was living in a poor Hispanic neighborhood in New Mexico. But I think it tells a fantastic story, and it starts with the words I want, quiero in Spanish. So here's what it says. I don't know if you can read it, but it says, I want a, try sounding out this word. I think it's a sort of phonetic Spanish. It says, I want a PlayStation, a South Park cassette for 64, so Nintendo 64. So this dates back a bit. And 100 dollars, $100. So now at this point, I've got to confess that I've cheated because I've actually Photoshopped this piece of paper because what it really looks like is this. The top bit's been scribbled out and it's been replaced by this one sentence which says, I want peace and for everyone to be happy. Yeah. Now, for me, I imagine a whole story. I imagine a teacher with a classroom full of children asking them to write down what they most wish for. And I imagine a boy sort of pouring his heart out onto this piece of paper and a teacher looking at it with dis dis you know, disapproval and sort of a quick revision. But as soon as he gets off the bus, I imagine a sort of throwing it out into my front garden and sort of poof so much for, for peace and happiness. But yet, I think that although this is a failed attempt, I actually think that learning is all about these really big changes in perspective, these really powerful shifts where we were able to see the world in very new and different ways, and we're able to see ourselves and our abilities in different ways, and in ways that are empowering. Now, don't get me wrong, I think everybody should have a PlayStation and $100, but I'm really interested in ways in which we can create learning experiences that are meaningful and that have an impact on people's lives. And in my lab, we try and use technology to design these sort of learning experiences and try and use technology in novel ways. But we also design for appropriation. And by that, I mean that we try and create so we try and design in such a way that learners can use the environments that we create in ways that we hadn't anticipated. Because we can learn a huge amount from that, both as educators and researchers. And basically, all I'd like to do today is show you a couple of examples of that. So the first project I want to talk about is a project that we've been working on for several years. And two of my researchers are somewhere out in the audience there. Um, and this is a project in which we get learners to create their own video games. So we use a combination of commercially available software and software that, that we've created ourselves to help young people with specific aspects of game creation. And we've been working on this project for several years with colleagues up in Edinburgh as well. So I'm going to take you through a sort of very whirlwind tour of what it's like to create a um, game using this tool set. So basically, what, what people start doing, you start with a blank canvas, and you can start doing things like terraforming. So create a little mountain range. You can change the texture, maybe to create a path. There's a whole series of buildings, placeables that you can add. You can add landscape items, all sorts of different trees. If we were up closer, you could see them swaying in the breeze. Now we're going to add a character here. So there's a little child that we're going to put. And for me, this is where it gets interesting you can create a conversation. So what we're going to do is add a conversation so that when the player goes into the game, he has a conversation with this child. And so I think what's going to happen is the child, I happen to know this by heart, the child's going to ask whether the player can help him find his dog. And what we're going to do is give the player two choices so the player can actually be nice and say, of course, I'll help you. you know, where did you last see him? Or we can give the player a sort of tough guy choice, and he can say, no, forget this. I don't really have time for this. And so this is what young people do in this sort of process of creating a game. And now I just want to show you, this is a game which was created by a young person in a recent game-making workshop, which we, which we ran a few months ago. You can see the player running over to a character. And I don't expect you to follow this. We've obviously speeded it up quite quickly. But this is just to give you a sense of what the games look like which these young people create. And the important thing to see here is that there's a very cinematic quality to it. And it looks very much like the sorts of games which these young people are actually used to playing themselves. And for them, that's a very powerful motivator. And actually, what we've got here is a story where uh, um, 
the player is told that there's a noble wanderer, sort of hapless noble wandering around, sort of looking for people. And uh, here he goes, uh, none of you good fellows happen to know where she is, do you? And he gets treated as an idiot. So you see a sort of story unfolding. So one outcome of this process is that we've turned a kind of very unlikely group, which is teenagers, and in particular teenage boys, into writers. So they spend a lot of time planning out these very complex stories with these very intricate storylines and branching plots. <laughs> <laughs> but before we actually get them doing that, the first thing we do is we ask them to write a review of their favorite game. And we often get games of this sort, so sort of run and gun, fast paced zombie shooter. And one of the things I was interested in is if you give young people the tools to create any sort of video game, what sorts of games do they create? And in particular, do they create violent video games if given the choice? And happily, at least for me, and I can report this to the Daily Mail, the answer is no. Um, there's a very interesting set of themes which emerge. One of them is around saving the world. So there's a lot of, now it's your turn to save Feralden and take back the land. Can you find the orbs, vanish the entity, and save Amkind? And possibly my favorite, in a land filled with war and job loss, you are the only one that can save a small, <laughs> insignificant village. <laughs> yeah, I personally like a bit of satire. But going hand in hand with that is the player as a hero. So the player's goal to find out who he is, save the world from imminent danger. I put this one in just to, for the joys of interviewing teenagers. Does the player have a goal in your game? Yes. So do you, tell me a little bit more. Find the creature that's destroyed the village and, and to find his family. And actually, this was really interesting. This top quote was probably the thing that got me interested in this to start with which is this, you see that your village is under attack and then you go tell your mother and then you suit up for the fights outside. And it seemed to me that this is such a beautiful crystallization of, of what it's like to be a teenager and that tension between being still tied to your family and sort of ready to, to start out. And I found that really encouraging. When I started looking at game themes, I realized that actually probably... Um, most, actually, the great majority of the games that these young people create have this family element, and I found that really positive. Um, so optimism, absolutely. Um, we take the young people through this process of game creation from start to finish, and we give them the tools to create their own games, and I think that's a very powerful and motivating process. Um, it gives them the chance to become writers, but I also think that there's something that we hadn't expected which is that it gives them the chance to experiment with identities. It gives them the chance to try out this being a hero, taking on saving the world and, and doing these heroic acts. And I think that's something very compelling. And for me, it's very hard to imagine another medium in which they could do something like that. So my next example is a very different sort of project. And this is called Echoes, sorry. This is a project that involves nine universities across the UK, and it's headed up by the London Knowledge Lab. But the work I want to talk about specifically is work that was carried out by the University of Edinburgh. And Echoes is a technology-enhanced learning environment designed for much younger children, both typically developing children and children on the autism spectrum. And the idea is that children can ex explore social and communication skills. They interact with this agent and with digital objects. And it takes place in this sort of magic garden where the objects have these magic properties. And so the specific task that I want to talk about is around joint attention. And I've got a sort of uh, academic definition of joint attention, which is the, the process whereby a person alerts another person to the presence of a stimulus using nonverbal means such as gazing or pointing. And what that might mean is, for example, I might look at you and attract your gaze. Obviously, it would be a lot easier if there weren't 250 of you. But I might look at you and then point over, say, at that lovely poster. And chances are, and I can see some of you doing it, you will follow 
my, my, either my gaze or my finger and do that. And you can already see what a crucial skill that is, both for any sort of social communication, social situations, and for learning. Because if I can't establish that joint attention with you, it's going to be very hard to then talk about things. In fact, if you think about what we're doing today, it's actually all about joint attention. So here, what Paul, the agent, is going to do with the child is point, look, establish gaze with the child, point, do, look at a flower and point to it, and then the child needs to touch that flower, and at the flower will go to a vase. So he's basically helping Paul pick these flowers. So when we tried this out with children on the autism spectrum, it, at the beginning we really had no idea whether they were going to be able to perform this task because children on the spectrum have known difficulties with joint attention. Um, so let's watch the video and see how they got on. Okay, he's going to come back again. It might be a different flower, it might be the same flower. Which one? Not that one. So look at, look at Paul. Look at Paul. Not that one. This one? Look at Paul. What's Paul doing? Not that one. This one? Try it. There we go. Sometimes if you're a bit quick, well then done. Paul, he might not be ready to show you. So wait for him to show you before you choose. Okay, let's try another one. Which one do you think Paul wants? This one. Well, touch the one you think is the one he wants. Not that one. Okay. okay, watch him again, watch him again. Which do you think? Yes. There yes. you go, all right. Paul couldn't fool well you. And then we'll die. Wait till he shows you. That's it. Yes. You were very I done it. You yes. did. Well done. You so remember to wait till he shows you before you pick it. Because otherwise it won't let you pick it. There's another one. Watch him. Watch him. All right. Yes! Well, no matter well, how tricky Paul is, he cannot fool you, can he? Yep. Here's the next flower. Remember to wait. Does he show me? He's waving. He's going to show you soon. This one. There we go. Yes! Thank you! Thank you! <laughs> Thank you. So, so as you can see, obviously I've sort of, sort of um, shortened this. This is over several trials, but you can see with a little bit of help and encouragement from the experimenters, the child actually does learn to follow the cues. And you see this point where he says, you know, he sort of goes to touch, and then he says, okay, I need to, I need to learn to wait. And that was incredibly encouraging and something that, again, we weren't expecting to find, but. Again, when you look out for these things that you, you know, look more broadly, maybe what you weren't expecting to find, what struck me is when this child makes this desperate bid to engage the experimenter in social interaction, it goes over like, you know, and the experimenter kind of goes, okay, go back to the, the screen. But, you know, we had imagined the social interaction happening between the child and the screen, and here he's really trying to broaden out the social interaction and include more people, and that is incredibly encouraging for us, and it's really interesting to see. So we've had a whole series of positive things like this, and I'll show you kind of the next video, which was our next sort of issue was, will they see Paul as an agent? Because there's no reason to believe that they would. They could just possibly... <laughs> And so what we see is them engaging in these sort of social interactions with Paul as if he is really an agent and not just an animation that they're watching. And again, knowing that a lot of these children don't engage in these sorts of interactions with, with their peers, again, that's really encouraging. And what I found interesting is they extend that. So there are the situations where 
they took it a little further and thought, okay, there's a situation where he should be reacting and doesn't. Like what happens when you poke him in the knee? Well done. I say to Yeah. <laughs> He's okay. He doesn't mind that. Paul's very patient. So clearly we hadn't programmed Paul to, you know, lift up his leg and say ouch, but he's there, so he's pokes him a bit. Paul doesn't do anything. He says, okay, maybe I better tell the experimenter something's wrong with Paul's clearly dysfunctional. I better let someone know. But, <laughs> but this is, again, really encouraging because you see a, a child with, with known social difficulties reacting to this agent on a screen in a, in a sort of very sort of interesting way. Um, and I'm just going to show you one last video, which is probably one of my favorites, and Thank I'll you. talk to you this about it. This is simple. Thank you. This is simple. Okay. You're doing a little tricky doing with your elbow now, huh? Thank you. Okay, that's the first toe touch we've seen. Thank you. I know it works. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and a header. Oh. 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 Now, don't think I can do this, but. Oh, that was a nose job. Nick. I was going to say, yeah, that might be a problem. Thank you. Maybe, maybe if we don't like the screen anymore. <laughs> and this, this is interesting because what I didn't show you, this, this young person had done about 10 trials and he had a real apprehension at the very beginning about is it actually, is it okay to pick the flowers? And we reassured him it's okay, it's a magic garden, they grow back. Because he, you know, he, by this point he got it down pat. But at this point he's, clearly determined at each trial to do something completely different in terms of interaction. And if you think about autism, one of the sort of defining characteristics of autism is this sort of rigid, rigid sort of patterns of interaction, there's very sort of systematic ways of doing things. And clearly you can see the cogs turning in this young person's mind where he wants to do something every single time. And okay, this is one child in one situation, but certainly this fills me with a huge amount of hope, and it suggests to me that maybe we're the ones with very rigid ideas about how these children behave, and we really need to think about how, what our ideas of, around autism are, really are. And I think for us, it's been really interesting to look at how technology can sort of broaden out our ideas around disability in this case. So optimism, yes, for me, bucket loads of it. Um, because I believe that if we de design technologies for meaningful learning and for appropriation, and we can allow, we allow ourselves to sort of sit back and learn from our learners as they take these tools and use them in ways that we never imagined, then they will amaze us every single time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>